Thank you very much, uh, MC, Adam. And thank you very much for the organizers of this uh, conference who have invited me from the southernmost part of Africa to grace this particular function. I'm going to uh, speak to you or present to you a paper on the role of uh, lawyers in the time of conflict in South Africa, that is during the apartheid period, and then also the role of the lawyers during the negotiating uh, period, and then the role of lawyers in uh, a post apartheid period. Now, in South Africa during uh, uh, the apartheid, the law was used as a tool for social engineering to perpetuate white supremacy and racial segregation. It was designed to, to subjugate and oppress the majority of the non-white population. This resulted in large-scale forced removals of people and destruction of settled and cohesive communities. Apartheid was declared a crime against humanity by the United Nations and the international community. It constituted a serious threat to international peace and security, and for that reason, it was declared a crime against humanity. It is, however, an irony uh, of history that some of the leading figures in the apartheid movement, as well as uh, leading members of the anti apartheid uh, movement, were members of the legal profession. In fact, they belonged to the same uh, bar council and they belonged to the same uh, law societies. In June 1964, when Mandela, uh, a lawyer by profession, was sentenced to life imprisonment, the Minister of Justice in the apartheid government was John Foster, who was also a lawyer by uh, profession, and ironically both of them belonged to the same law society. It is also not surprising that the peace talks in South Africa, the anti-apartheid movement was led by Mandela, and the apartheid movement was led by F.W. de Clare. Both of them were lawyers by profession. During the apartheid, uh, during apartheid progressive anti apartheid lawyers were continuously harassed by the state. In 1952, Mandela, a practicing lawyer, was involved in the anti apartheid defiance campaign. Mandela was convicted for defying the apartheid laws. He was given a suspended sentence of nine month imprisonment. In April 1954, the Law Society brought an application in court to strike out the name of Mandela from the role of attorneys on the basis that he was not a fit and proper person to practice law. The court, however, dismissed the application and made no order insofar as cost was concerned. Later, candidate attorney of the legal firm of Mandela and Tombo, it was one of the first black legal firms that operated in South Africa. Uh, the uh, candidate attorney, Godfrey Peachy, was convicted of and fined for contempt of court for refusing to address the court from uh, a table that was specifically reserved for non-white uh, lawyers. At the end of 1956, Mandela was once again arrested and charged with treason because of his peaceful political activities against the unjust laws of apartheid. At the end of a lengthy trial lasting more than five years, he was found not guilty and acquitted. After his acquittal, permission for him to practice in the city of Johannesburg was withdrawn. He was required to practice in an African township, some distance away from the seat of the court. Advocate Brown Fisher was the lead counsel in Mandela's treason trial and his Livonia trial. He was arrested and charged in 1964 for certain political crimes. He was released on bail and went underground and fell into a trial. In November 1965, the Bar Council moved the court to strike uh, Fisher's name from the role of advocates. After he was re-arrested, he said from the dock, and I quote, 
I believe in the doctrine of legality as my political conscience does not permit me to follow the law arising from the unjust policy of apartheid. In May 1966, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. I also personally encountered a number of oppressive measures when I opened my practice on the 1st of June 1963 in downtown Cape Town, commonly known as District 6. I acted for victims of apartheid. Uh, District 6 was, the, it was a unique, multicultural, multilingual, and multiracial area. On the 1st of February 1966, the area was declared a white group area, preventing people from color from uh, occupying and own, owning property in District 6. I was a founding member of the District 6 Defense Committee to resist the declaration uh, of the area as a white group area. The committee organized peaceful protest actions and demonstrations. The uh, security police harassed members and participants, and I was practically hounded out of the area and forced to close my practice in June 1967. In 1978, ten years later, I reopened my practice in an area proclaimed as a colored group area. My practice grew rapidly and we once more served prominent political activists and organizations in defending them for political crimes. In 1984, my professional assistant and an article crowd were arrested and charged with being in a black area without a, pers uh, without a permit for consulting clients in that area. When the matter came before the court, they were found not guilty because the state proved that the hall in which they actually gathered for purpose of consultation, half of the uh, uh, hall fell within the black area, the other half fell in the colored area, and as a result of that, they were acquitted. We approached the Law Society to assist in this matter. Uh, they wrote to Kubi Kutsi, who subsequently was the main uh, actor in the negotiations between Mandela and, uh, and the apartheid regime. He refused to withdraw the matter. Uh, the matter, in fact, was a very petty matter, and the object of the security police in prosecuting my professional assistant and the article class uh, uh, Clark was in fact to harass them. Now, apart from the police, we also found the officials in this particular area, it's a rural area about 500 uh, kilometers from the city uh, of Cape Town. Uh, we found the court officials extremely uncooperative and hostile regarding political matters. The objective of these court officials was to harass the accused and bring our firm into disrepute. The old sworn attorney circle had taken a conscious decision not to defend any uh, political accused, any accused who were charged with political offences uh, in that area. They also refused to take any brief from us, from outside the, the area, in order to defend uh, political activists in that area. In fact, the, it was the, against the code of the Law Society for attorneys not to take a brief unless they had very, very good reason. And uh, the question that they were charged for political offences was not one of those reasons that they could deny a brief. In 1987, uh, Pierre Andre Alberti, a Frenchman, was arrested with Arnold Stafili by the apartheid security police and detained in communicado in terms of the security uh, legislation. I was instructed by the French embassy to render the necessary legal service to Albertini. The security police managed to force out a statement from Albertini 
Stofiri was subsequently charged with sedition and the state intended calling of Albertini as a state witness. I, brief advocate Adala Omar, as counsel for Albertini, we appeared in court uh, in the Bantustan of Sistai when Albertini was called to testify against Stofiri. He refused. Omar informed the court that he had instructions from me to appear for Albertini and moved the court for a postponement to enable us to consult Albertini. Up to that stage, we had no access to Albertini because he was going to be called as a state witness as well. He was held in terms of the security legislation incommunicado until he appeared. And when he appeared, uh, he refused to testify. The judge asked whether uh, Advocate Omar had the right of appearance before his court. He replied that he had the right to appear in all South African courts. The judge said this guy is an independent state and he must be enrolled to appear before his court. Omar retorted that the international community does not regard this guy as an independent state and neither does the majority of the South African citizens regard Siskai as an independent state. The judge then asked whether I was registered uh, with the Law Society uh, of Siskai uh, as a lawyer to appear before his court. I replied I was registered with the Law Society of South Africa uh, and like, uh, the, and, and for the same reasons, uh, that Omar gave, I was not a member of the local uh, law society. In fact, the judge barred both Omar and I from appearing in his court. We asked for a sorted adjournment and I to get local counsel and local attorney to appear on behalf of uh, Albertini. Albertini was eventually sentenced to four years imprisonment for refusing to testify, and Stofili was sentenced to 18 years imprisonment uh, for terrorism. After Mandela was installed as the first president of the Democratic South Africa, he invited prominent lawyers and judges uh, at a state function to thank them for the contribution they made to transition from apartheid to democracy. As fate would have it, I was seated at the same table as the judge who barred, who barred us from his court and sentenced Stofili to life in prison, uh, sorry, to 18 years imprisonment. At that stage, Omar was the Minister of Justice in the Mandela government and in charge of all the judges, including the judges that barred him from appearing before his court. Stofili was the premier of the province in which the court was located. I later became a colleague of that judge on the bench. When reminded of the incident, he was extremely embarrassed and, uh, and apologetic and said he was impressed at the sense of reconciliation of the new political order. The Law Society and the Bar Council offered no assistance to protect its members against harassment of each member by security police or state officials. They were compensated with the regime and referred to unjust uh, laws rather than exposed to, in, to the inequities and racial discrimination inherent in the administration of justice in the apartheid courts. In 1985, Mandela initiated talks with the apartheid government from prison in order to find a peaceful political <coughs> solution to the problem. These talks were conducted between two lawyers, namely Kobe Kutsi uh, and Mandela. These talks culminated eventually uh, uh, in the release of Mandela and all political prisoners, the unbearing of political organizations and the creation of the necessary climate to enable negotiations to take place. During negotiations, Mandela led the anti-apartheid group and declared the pro-apartheid group. 
negotiations eventually led to the adoption of a democratic constitution and the establishment of, a, of the Truth Commission. The greatest challenge facing lawyers internationally is the anti-terror legislation which forms the domestic laws of many jurisdictions. The anti-terror legislation has abrogated the rule of law, basic human rights and fundamental freedoms. In some countries, lawyers have been identified with their clients and their causes in the execution of their professional functions and duties, and like their clients, have been charged in terms of anti-terror legislation. Fortunately, in South Africa, the Constitution which embraces the Bill of Rights is the supreme law of the country and South African citizens, including lawyers, enjoy constitutional protection against the provision of anti-terror legislation. A fitting end to this presentation would no doubt be a statement by Nelson Mandela, the first president of the Democratic South Africa, at its inauguration on the 10th of May 1994, and I quote, Never, never, never shall it be that this beautiful land will experience the oppression of one by another. The sun shall never set upon so glorious a human achievement. Let freedom reign. Thank you very much.